So good morning, everyone. Um, I hope all is well with you and your families in these uh, difficult times we're living in. Um, welcome to the first webinar organized between the uh, bachelor's degree in physical education and sport and the, the Kinesio Lab of Piaget Institute. Uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Denise Suarez with us, who is the coordinator of the Kinesio Lab. We have myself, Jose Mira, I'm the coordinator of the bachelor's degree, and uh, today's speaker is gonna be Paolo Giovanetti, uh, and I would like to thank you for your presence here, and also thank all the participants for, for being here with us. Um, I would like to give you some, some details about, about the bachelor's and the kinesio lab. So the bachelor's degree is a three-year course offered by Piaget Institute, and it is possible to have five different areas of specialization. We have exercise and health, we have sports management, we have sports coaching, we have teaching of physical education, and uh, we still have exercise and health. Um, the Kinesio Lab is a laboratory of human movement analysis, which focuses on research areas such as exercise, sports performance, and neurosciences. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, a colleague and a, a good friend of mine, Paolo Giovanetti. Um, Paolo has completed his bachelor's degree in sports sciences uh, in the University of Rome Foro Italico. He also holds a master's degree in health and physical activity, activity uh, which also included two different internships, one at the University of Southern Denmark and another one in the University of Cologne, which is in Germany. Um, Paolo also holds a master's degree in posture, which was awarded by the Open Academy of, of Medicine. And um, in terms of, uh, of practical uh, experience, Paolo has spent the last seven years working as a personal uh, trainer, uh, especially in, uh, in HITS, so in high interval intensity training with, uh, with um, healthy adults, so to improve their performance, but also with, with elderly population. Um, so this is, this is Paulo's background. Today's presentation is gonna be entitled, as you probably uh, saw before, HIT, so High Intensity Interval Training, a training method to improve our health. And I'll, I'll give you some important information of today's webinar. Uh, the presentation will uh, last about 35 to 45 minutes and uh, at the end there will be 15 to 20 minutes of questions. Um, this webinar is going to work a little bit differently compared to the classes we have uh, during our, our bachelor's degree so you will be asked to add your questions in the in the window that says questions and answers so Q&A you can write down your questions you're, you will not be allowed to, to uh, turn on your microphone. So anything you have to, to ask, you can just type in. Mm. And uh, at the end of, of the webinar, we kindly ask you to answer just three simple questions, just for us to understand if you, if you liked the webinar and if you would like us to repeat the, the experience. Paulo, um, you can, you can start the presentation whenever you want. I wish you good luck, and I'm sure that it's going to be very interesting for all of us. Okay. I'm going to share the screen. Uh, it should be okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so just before uh, we start, um, I want to thank the Institute of Piaget 
and Kinesio Lab, uh, my friend Professor Jose Mira for inviting me and uh, for having me here and to make this possible. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me and I uh, really hope the presentation is going to be uh, interesting and helpful for you. Um, so as the title say, uh, we're going to talk about uh, HIT, High Intensity Interval Training, a training method to improve our health. Uh, so let's have a look at what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about earth rate variability, then the autonomic nervous system, and finally, we'll discuss about high intensity interval training and we will see some practical example and draw some conclusion, of course. So, uh, as the title says, uh, we're going to talk about our health. So let's first see what health means. Uh, here we have a famous definition by the World Health Organization that say health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or uh, infirmity. So uh, I think that here the most important part of the definition is where it says that the absence of disease or infirmity doesn't mean being healthy. So we need more than just that. And uh, in the last years, uh, a possible marker of health has come up and it's the earth rate variability. Earth rate variability is a fluctuation of in time intervals between adjacent heartbeats, as you can see in the picture below. A healthy earth is not a metronome. So earth rate variability indexes neurocarotid function and is generated by earth rate interactions and dynamic nonlinear autonomic nervous system, which operate to help us adapt to environmental and psychological challenges. So the HRD reflects regulation of autonomic balance, blood pressure, gas exchange, gut, earth, and vascular tone. So as you can see uh, in the picture below, uh, our Earth, as I say, is not a metronome. So the time between one bit and another is not always the same. And this is something good for our health because it helps us to adapt to stress, to disease, and to all the challenges we are in every day. So uh, as we can see, uh, this was uh, taken from a, a review uh, on 2000. 17, and it says that the earth rate variability declines with decreased health. So if we have a poor health, our earth rate variability will be poor as well. So the autonomic cardiac dysregulation is a critical process that underlies the manifestation and interpretation of poor health symptoms. Earth rate variability has been shown to be a useful to be useful in predicting morbidities from common mental. So like stress and depression and physical disorders, like inflammation, chronic pain, diabetes, and so on. All of which increase sympathetic output and create a self-perpetuating cycle that produces autonomic imbalance and greater allostatic load. So the autonomic nervous system, this function is a systemic common denominator of poor health and associated with acute and chronic illness and uh, a risk factor for such a serious health issues as cancer survivorship, cardiovascular disease, and myocardial infarction stroke, and overall mortality. So basically what we uh, have seen in the last year, what the literature to say is that the autonomic nervous system is actually crucial for our health. If our autonomic nervous system works properly, then we can be healthy because it's going to affect the earth rate variability and uh, uh, the, the, all the branches of the autonomic nervous system, of course. So uh, uh, earth rate variability can also uh, be used to assess uh, overtraining in athletes. And I think this is a really interesting thing because we know that when uh, an athlete is in overtraining, is a uh, high risk of injury. So if there is a way, there is, uh, to evaluate a possible overtraining, 
that will be uh, a great tool for our athletes. So, but uh, as I say, it's not just for athletes, the that counts for athletes and elderly people, adults, young, young person, and so on. And the earth rate variability can be measured in milliseconds using an uh, ECG, which is the gold standard, but as we can imagine, is not that practical uh, if we want to test the earth rate variability every day. So there are also professional devices that use uh, plethysmography. And in the picture below, you can see the device I used, uh, which is provided by Biotechna, which is an Italian uh, industry. And it's called PPG Stress Flow. But uh, these devices, uh, I would say, they are quite expensive. And if we want to start to look at the artery variability, and I'll change every day or after a trading, we can use app as well. There are numerous uh, apps on the on the store that you can look for. If I can recommend you, um, I wouldn't go for the free one because the quality will be really low. Um, so maybe try to buy one and the, the cost is really affordable because we are talking about no more than 10 euros. So if you want to have a look closely, closer to F3 variability, uh, an app is a good solution. When we measure the F3 variability, as I say, we end up with a measure in milliseconds. If, if that measure is below 50 milliseconds, it, it indicates poor uh, health and stress adaptation. If it is between 50 and 100 milliseconds, it indicates an healthy status. So it's what we, we hope, what we look for. But if we go between 100 and 200 milliseconds, it can indicate a performing status. So kind of more than healthy is where we actually want, want to be. And uh, higher is not always better. So if it goes over 200 milliseconds, it means that we are overtraining. So if we are an athlete, we should stop training, or at least we should reduce the intensity and the volume of our training and see why uh, we went in the status or if we're not talking about lead, we are in a, state, uh, in a stage that is called burnout. So it basically means that our autonomic nervous system doesn't understand anymore if it's night or day, it cannot adapt anymore to the stress we, we might face during the day. But the good, news, the, good, the good news is that, of course, we can reverse this and we can, can go back to a normal uh, autonomic nervous system. So uh, we, and we're going to, to, to look how to do it. Before uh, we go further, let's talk about a bit about the autonomic nervous system. Uh, we all know that it has three branches, uh, the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system, and the enteric nervous system. Uh, the sympathetic nervous system uh, is dominant during the daytime, or at least it should be. Uh, it has a fight or flight response to stress, whether it's a real stress, like the zebra in the picture, or just a perceived stress. What I mean uh, by perceived stress is basically something that is not real, like we may be walking in a dark street alone, there is no one, so technically there is not really a reason to be afraid, but from some reason we're scared. And for our autonomic nervous system, it doesn't make any change. If it's real or perceived, it's going to react exactly at this, in the same way. So it's going to increase the F rate, enhance blood, blood flow to skeletal muscle and lungs, increase peripheral vasoconstruction, and release catecholamines. So as you can see, all these reactions are meant to get us ready to fight, ready to do physical activity, or maybe just to work. So as I say in the last lines, you release the catecholamines, and because of the catecholamines, especially epinephrine and norepinephrine, we're going to fight our HPA axis, and which stands for hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenocortical axis. Uh, as I say, because of the epinephrine and norepinephrine, um, the, the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus releases the corticotropin release hormone. 
that stimulates the anterior pituitary to produce adrenocorticotropin hormone that in turn stimulate the release of cortical from the abdominal cor cortex. So this process is our way to respond to any kind of stress, but it is more than that. In fact, we want the HPA axis to be acting in a specific, specific time of the day uh, as well, and we will see that in, in a moment. Let's first see the other branch of the autonomic nervous system, which is the parasympathetic nervous system, which should be dominant during the night. And it's also called the rest and digest system because it either increases after meals, uh, it increases heart rate, and increases blood flow to the gastrointestinal tract. So once again, to digest and to rest, as you can see in the picture. So let's try to put everything together. Um, in this slide, uh, our body system, we know that follow a circadian rhythm. If we look on the right at six o'clock and we say, for example, that we wake up at 7.30, this is the moment where we should have our sympathetic nervous system dominant. And so the catecholamines and eventually the cortisol. So as I say, the HPA axis is not just something to respond to stress, but because the cortisol is a catabolic hormone, it also helps us to get the energies to face the day. Uh, as, it, as we go toward the sunset and the night, our sympathetic nervous system should go down and the parasympathetic nervous system should be dominant. If the sympathetic nervous system goes down, the cortisol goes down as well and the melatonin can be released and we can fall asleep and have a proper sleep. The growth hormone uh, goes up as well and reaches its peak during the night. And we know that the growth hormone uh, is an anabolic hormone. Uh, so we're going to recover. And the immune system is going to be more active as well. So this process has to be repeated every day, uh, respecting the sleep awake cycle. But there are many causes that can desynchronize this clock. For example, chronic stress, pain, a bad lifestyle. When this clock doesn't work properly anymore, we are high risk to get disease. And once again, the literature in the last day has been really um, powerful on these things. I just think that on 2017, uh, three researchers from the United States uh, has been prized with the uh, Nobel Prize because of their study on circadian rhythms. So once again, uh, the autonomic nervous system, the circadian rhythms, the HRV are crucial if we want to be healthy, if we want to call ourselves a healthy person. So now let's uh, have a look at the high intensity interval training as a tool to reach the healthy status. What is a high intensity interval training? Uh, it's a form of, of training that uses repeated high intensity exercise bouts interspersed with brief recovery periods. Uh, as you can see in the picture, we have an example of the earth rate during a hit session. They are recorded. So you can see the ups and downs, which means the intensity was reaching the so-called red zone for several seconds, followed by seconds of active rest. And it lasted 20 minutes, pretty much, warm-up included. So the high-intensity training is not just a tool uh, effective for our health, but it's also time efficient. So in just 20 minutes, we can reach uh, the adaptation you're looking for. Um, as I say, during high intensity interval training, we want to reach at least the 80-85% of the, our VO2 max, which, uh, as I say, is the red zone. The VO2 is, the, is our oxygen uptake, is a measure of a person's ability to take in oxygen by the respiratory system and deliver it to the working tissue by the cardiovascular system and the ability of the working tissue to use oxygen. So basically, is the VO2 is the amount of oxygen I take when I breathe in 
and the amount of that oxygen my body system is able to take and use to produce energy. And the VO2 is the most accurate method for regulating uh, exercise intensity. But unfortunately, to measure the VO2 max is not easy and requires a laboratory. But there is something else we can use, as you can see uh, in the picture. Uh, this is the famous Italian footballer, which is probably what we think is VO2 max. I wish it was enough. So, what else we can do? Um, as we can see in the in the tab here, the VO2 max doesn't correlate that much with the maximum heart rate, so the first and the third column. But we can use the formula here to get the uh, heart rate reserve, which correlates way better uh, with the VO2 max. So first. First thing, we have to know the maximum heart rate. Easy formula, I'm sure all of you know, uh, is 206.9 minus 0 0.69 times age. Once we get that, uh, we calculate the um, heart rate reserve, which is maximum heart rate minus resting heart rate. If, if you want to know your resting heart rate, you just have to measure your heart rate early in the morning as soon as you wake up. You can do that for a couple of days in a row and just use that number. So once we have the earth rate reserve, we can now know the target uh, earth rate, which is basically the earth rate we want to reach during the high intensity interval training. So let's say that we want to train at the 80% of the VO2 max, we can do the uh, earth rate reserve times exercise intensity, so it will be 0.8 plus the resting heart rate again. So we can use this formula to be really, really precise. And uh, now let's see how to build a heat session. So now we know uh, how to measure our heart rate reserve. Uh, if we want to improve our VO2 max, so in order to get the benefits on our heart rate variability as well, the work the composite ratio has to be one to one, which means that the time of the working interval uh, should be as much as the recovery one, or even longer. But smaller ratio, like one to 1.5 or one to two, can be used with beginners. So people who uh, don't train usually, or also people that usually train, but not with high intensity interval training. Uh, the work interval can be short, uh, maximum 45 to one minute, or long, more than one and two minutes. The recovery intervals can be active or passive. A general rule could be to perform an active recovery if it lasts more than two minutes. Uh, the idea is to keep the VO2 high, so there is no need of a great contribution of the anaerobic system in the next work intervals. Use a passive recovery also when the work interval is short. So if we are maybe doing 45 seconds of high intensity, it will be better to recover in a passive way. Uh, the literature and the physiology say that um, in order to get all the adaptation, we should train two, three times per week and with 48 hours between one session and the other. Uh, um, now let's get the HIIT modalities. So we can perform an high intensity interval training on treadmill, bike, rowing machine, free weights, or use no equipment, equipment just, the, just the body weight. So that's another really cool thing, I think. Uh, now we have some example of the high intensity interval training taken from the literature. So they were on published articles. We can see long interval, two to three minutes at the 90% of the intensity, followed by uh, less than two minutes of passive recovery. Uh, you can do from six to 10 uh, repetition. Uh, if you can see the last column, you say the time at the VO2 max that you will spend if you do this kind of hit program. 
and it will be more than 10 minutes because what we what we want to do what we want to try to reach when we do our intensity interval training is to spend at least five minutes at the vo2 max so when you write down your your training make sure that the amount of time uh, is going to allow you to stay at the vo2 max for at least 10 minutes uh, another example will be two three minutes at the 90 percent follow followed by uh, more than four minutes of active recovery at the 60% of intensity. Once again, last column, more than 10 minutes spent at the VO2 max. These are just examples. So if you try and you see that you cannot complete the, uh, the entire uh, high intensity interval training, of course you can change and maybe do less, re less repetition. So it really depends on the fitness level that you have or your clients have. Another example can be four minutes and 90%, followed by three minutes of active recovery, uh, do full repetition. Now, if, if you see at the short intervals, another example can be 15 seconds of high intensity interval training, followed by less than 15 seconds of passive recovery. You can do uh, from one, two, three series, and every series can last eight minutes. And the time between one series and the other one can be four to five minutes in an active way. But as I said, these are just examples. What is really important is the last column again. It doesn't matter if you use long interval or short interval, you are able to spend at least 10 times or five times if that is your goal at the VO2 max. So uh, the more more time you spend at the VO2 max, the quicker and better will be for your VO2 max, of course, and at play variability. So now let's go back on this picture again. Uh, we have seen the importance of the circadian rhythms and of the autonomic nervous system. So now let's see how we can use a high intensity interval training to re-synchronize our clock and our rhythms. So as I said before, uh, in the morning, we, will, we want our sympathetic nervous system to be active. And so the FPA axis and cortisol. So what we can do in the morning, after we wake up, we can uh, wash our hands and our face with cold water. I, I know it doesn't sound really cool, but trust me, it's really doable uh, you don't need much time, just one, two minutes, that would be great to activate the sympathetic nervous system. Then if you know any breathing exercise, that would be great as well. And then you can perform an high-intensity interval training. Now, don't get scared of doing uh, an high-intensity interval training in the morning. You don't need equipment, equipment, as I say, and you can follow really easy exercise. For example, for people who are not trained, you can just use one minute on and one minute off. Just stand up and sit on a chair. That would be really a good exercise for that. But if you know that you are trained enough, you can remove the chair and just perform a squat for one minute and then rest for one minute. Or if you are really trained, you can lay down on the floor and then stand up, maybe jump. So basically a body. So as I said, this can be a morning routine. And as we, say, uh, we have seen before, it doesn't take longer because you can do everything in half an hour. But if, if for some, some reason you can do it in the morning, you can do it in the afternoon. Uh, so another example, as I said before, can be four minutes on and the 90% of the, is the target rate with three minutes of active recovery. Now, I say afternoon, I didn't say evening. That's because as I said before, um, when we start to go towards the night, we want our parasympathetic nervous system to be more active than the sympathetic nervous system. So if we know that the person or ourselves uh, have desynchronized our clock, uh, our circadian rhythms and our autonomic nervous system is not working properly anymore, it would be better to, to keep the training away from the sunset. So uh, 
we don't do, we don't create a contrast between the sympathetic nervous system that is stimulated by the heat training and the parasympathetic nervous system that has to be active during night. So this can be a really strong advice to resynchronize the clock and to look for the healthy status that we said before. Really, really powerful tool. Uh, now uh, I wanna give you some example of a free variability. Uh, this is a girl, 20 years old, and um, as you can see, the, the red dots uh, in the middle where it says cutter, that is the earth ray variability. It, and as you can see, the red dots are all close to another. So that means the earth, earth rate doesn't uh, change that much. So the variability is really, really low and that's not good for the health. And after one month, as you can see, one session per week, because that's what the client asked for. So we are far away from the recommendation. After one week of high intensity interval training, as you can see the red dots on the right, uh, they have more space in between. So that means the earth free variability has changed, has improved, and now she can adapt better to stress. And uh, I guarantee you she was feeling way better. And uh, now I want to show you uh, a body composition analysis because as I say, it's not just about the autonomic nervous system, but we can change our body composition as well. And again, this is one session per week. This is a, a guy, 35 years old. As you can see, I hope you can see properly, the weight was 75 kilograms and in two months and a half, almost, uh, he was able to lose a couple of kilograms, but the good thing is that the skeletal muscle increased. So we didn't touch the skeletal muscle because a mistake that usually people do is that when they, they jump on a scale and they see that they have one kilogram more or one kilogram less, they say, oh, I gain one kilogram of fat or maybe I, lose one, I lost one kilogram of fat. But this is something we can't really, can't really know unless we are going to measure it. So the skeletal muscle improved, increased. And uh, if you go down and see the FM, that's the fat mass. And it went from 23 kilograms to 21. And the EO2 max, as I say, increased as well because it went from fair to good. And uh, he was a guy that wanted to train once, once per week because he had chronic back pain. So it, it was not easy for him to have a high intensity training more than once per week. But as you can see, a few times, just once per week, we can still uh, get some good results. And I guarantee you, it was feeling way better as well. So here, uh, I wanna leave you a little homework if you want. Uh, this can be an example of a hit session. So you can start with a warm up, of course, 10, 15 minutes. And then you can start performing a jumping jack for 30 seconds, mountain climber for 30 seconds, and push up for 30 seconds, and repeat all again uh, before you start your recovery, which can be two minutes, two minutes in a passive way. After the two minutes, you can do skip exercise for one minute and back this for 30 seconds. You do it again and then you can recover it again for two minutes and then you start all over again for uh, repeating for two times. At the end, of course, a bit of cool down, five minutes, even more if you need. And if you just do the math, this is going to be less than 45 minutes warm up and cool down included. So once again, really, really effective for our health and really a uh, short time spending exercising. Uh, uh, so I wanna leave you with uh, a take home message as well. The high intensity interval training is an effective tool to improve health and it can affect our variability, VO2 max and body composition as we have seen. When performing in the morning, it can help to synchronize the circadian rhythms to its stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system and the activation of the HPA axis. 
a heat session should last uh, maximum 30 minutes at the VO2 max, of course, I'm talking about, and it should be performed two or three times per week. It can be performed by healthy person, at least, and also people with cardiovascular disease or diabetes, actually. On the literature, there are really interesting articles about people with cardiovascular disease and people with diabetes because we can also increase the uh, number of uh, blood pool and uh, it's also uh, safe for people with cardiovascular disease. Of course, when you have these kind of problems, you always have to check your doctor but as we proved that the high intensity interval training is effective and also more effective than uh, moderate continuous training. So this was my last slide. Thank you very much for the attention. I uh, hope you were able to get something from this presentation that you can use tomorrow or maybe from the next week. Uh, here you can see my social media account on uh, Instagram, Facebook or my email. So if you have more questions, if you want to ask something or just uh, have a talk about intensity interval training or health, uh, just send me a message and I will reply and I, I will really appreciate it. So once again, uh, thank you at the Institute. Thank you, Jose, and I'm here for questions. Thank you, Paolo, for such an interesting uh, presentation. I think you brought up uh, a very uh, trendy and um, important matter in, in, in sports exercise. And you really uh, showed in a very effective way uh, how effective high intensity interval training can be to improve one's health and especially to improve heart rate variability. So uh, if the participants have specific questions, you're welcome to add your questions in the Q&A, so questions and answers uh, option, which is at the bottom of your screen. You can add your questions and then it will, uh, myself and Dr. Denise will pose the questions to Paolo. So we have uh, a question here, Paolo. What, yeah. what is the melatonin's effect? The high intensity interval training on melatonin. Uh, so, so the question was was a, a bit general about the melatonin effect, but I presume that it's uh, related to the to high intensity interval training. Yeah, uh, we we don't uh, affect the melatonin directly the high intensity interval training, but what we know is that melatonin and cortisol follow a circadian rhythms. So when the cortisol is high, the melatonin is down, is really low. And if you keep the cortisol high, high, both in the morning and in the evening, you can't really have a proper sleep. So if people have like sleeping disorders, what they have to try to do is to resynchronize the clock. So that means that the, part, the sympathetic nervous system has to, uh, let me say, shut down in the evening. So the parasympathetic nervous system can kick in and the melatonin can be produced. Um, this, is, this goes with the um, sleep and awake cycle because we know that we have specific receptors on, on our eyes that communicate with our hypothalamus. So when, the, when there is the light, the pituitary, the pituitary gland is in a bit. So it can produce the, the melatonin. But be careful because uh, devices like laptop, uh, tablet, or Kindle, uh, they have a blue light. And that blue light can stimulate the, the receptors of our eyes as well. So if you have like sleeping disorder, which I think might be the reason of the question, I would suggest not to use these devices uh, during, the, during the night after dinner because that stimulates the, the uh, pituitary gland and it wouldn't produce the melatonin. So this is a suggestion I can give. I don't know if I answer uh, the question, but as I say, we can go on melatonin with hits, but if we resynchronize the clock using hits, 
then the melatonin is going to be uh, better and it's going to be produced at the right time as well. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, we have here uh, another question um, asking about the damage in the autonomic nervous system. If the inactivity of the person can be can damage the autonomic nervous system, and if the heat uh, training can recover this this damage. Sorry, I, mean, uh, uh, sorry, I missed the first part. Uh, an impair of the autonomic nervous system. If it's damaged by inactivity. Oh yeah, of course. If you if you like don't exercise, uh, if you uh, inactive, uh, of course it can be. Well, damage is a big word. But uh, I like to use more desynchronized, so it doesn't work properly anymore. It doesn't get the right stimulus to work properly. So, of course, uh, as I say in the presentation, the, the physical activity is a really powerful tool to resynchronize the clock. So, if you know that you have this issue, you can follow the recommendation I said before and try to resynchronize, especially the cold water in the morning and the heat session will help a lot. Perfect. Paulo, we have here another question, which uh, would be my question too. <laughs> uh, is, it, is it more effective uh, high intensity interval training during, uh, during running, cycling, or with body weight exercises like burpees? Like, is there a difference between the different methods of high intensity interval training and the, the, the benefits they, they can bring? Uh, yes and no. And I'm going to explain that. Uh, what really matters when we do the high intensity interval training is that we spend the time that we decide at high intensity. So it doesn't matter if you're running, if you're cycling, if you're doing practice, it doesn't really matter as long as you can keep the, the intensity. So be careful, for example, sometimes we uh, see on social media people using like bar barbell and dumbbells, they can be used that, for example, if you have an exercise like can be uh, Olympic uh, lifts, like a uh, jerk on clean, you have a phase, and uh, an active phase, when you push hard, so you can for sure reach the intensity. But when you put the barbell down, the intensity goes down. And you don't want the up and downs into the work interval. During the work interval, you want the intensity to be as high as you want it. So it doesn't matter the exercise, it matters, it matters the uh, intensity. And we also know that the more muscle you involve the base. So uh, if you do it on a, on a bike, you will use uh, the legs, which is absolutely fine. You can do that. But if you use more muscle, that will be better. That really doesn't change. Then it's up to the person. If you like to ride a bike, ride a bike. If you like, also what you have. If you maybe at home you want to start an high intensity interval program and you don't have equipment, just do the exercise I said before. Uh, you can really do whatever you want as long as the intensity is kept. Here we have another question that I, I think it's a very common uh, question about this high intensity interval training because the, 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 the name says high intensity and someone is asking about uh, when you are starting beginning the, 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 the training process does it make sense to do high intensity interval training? Yeah this is a common question and people usually get scared because there's the high intensity but you can do it uh, if you want, if you because you think you're gonna be safer, you can start doing not uh, high intensity, just interval training. But if you uh, like, if your doctor say that you can you can be active, you can do physical activity. There's really no reason to be afraid. As I say, the literature has many articles about so people with cardiovascular disease, people who have strokes um, and stuff like that. So is it safe? Uh, it's up to you. Of course, if I am a beginner, as I said before, I wouldn't start maybe with five minutes of uh, high intensity but interval training. Maybe I would start with 30 seconds, then I'm going to recover for a longer time. So um, uh, maybe I can go uh, back on the, uh, on the line, maybe it can be better. I have a question here 
question myself. <laughs> ah, come on. As I say here, the work recovery ratio it has to be one to one for optimal adaptation. But if we are beginners, we can start doing like one minute of work interval and two minutes of, of recovery. That will fit in as well. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Denise, you wanna you wanna ask your question? No, I'm gonna ask first the, the, this one from the from Anna that she's yeah. asking how many trays per week is it necessary? To, to get some benefits? Uh, two, three, uh, I say two, three times per week. But as I show, uh, yeah. we were able to get some adaptation even with one session per week. So uh, we also have to keep in mind the recommendation uh, coming from the, from the organization that say 150 minutes uh, of moderate training. That is still the, the uh, let's say, official recommendation. So you have to try to reach the numbers, but two, three times per week, uh, that will that will make uh, a big, a big change in the body system for sure. Okay. Thank you, Paulo. We have another question here. Nunu, people have their own best working productive hours. Uh, if I'm more a night person on productivity, I'm damaging my autonomic nervous system. Uh, it depends uh, because uh, we know that uh, some people work at night. Uh, like just uh, let's have a look at doctors nowadays or nurses. So of course, we can say no, don't go to work because otherwise your clock will be desynchronized. We can synchronize, but if we work like uh, in the morning, like let's say normal uh, shift. And if you're more productive uh, on night, uh, you should really try to change that way because if you don't get the proper sleep, if you keep your uh, sympathetic nervous system uh, active during the night as well, then you going you might go into a situation uh, that is called of um, flat cortisol, which means that your cortisol is not just high in the morning uh, as it, it should be but also in the night. And we have seen that this is not something that we want. So uh, as, once again, if you're not a night worker, uh, you should try to keep your system into the circadian rhythms. Because if you change that, then you are at high risk of disease. One of these is the uh, low-grade chronic inflammation. There has been shown to be uh, an inflammation in every single disease we have. It doesn't matter if it's an autoimmune disease uh, or it's like cancer or cardiovascular disease. All these diseases have in common the low-grade chronic inflammation. So this is really a situation you don't want to have. Mm -hmm. uh, once again, uh, in uh, couldn't cover all the, the topics in, uh, in the presentation, of course, because uh, we can talk for hours, but feel free to, to send me a message and I can explain the deeper and better, and we can try to, to resynchronize the clock. Uh, uh, can I ask now, Zeth? Yeah, sure, of course you can. Once I was in a meeting, I was uh, watching a seminar in a Congress, and uh, one of the researchers that were, were presenting, he said that uh, high intensity interval training could be damaged for people that are diagnosed with uh, hypertension. Uh, since I was in a seminar, I didn't, uh, I, I couldn't realize what he really means about it. But do you have an opinion about it? That people with hypertension could uh, uh, do uh, HIIT training. We, uh, there is a study. And uh, if you want, I can send you because um, I'm sure I have downloaded it. Uh, that say the high intensity interval training uh, can also improve the uh, endothelium function. So then, of course, it depends on the damage that the people have. Because that's why I say all, always follow the, the doctor advice. But uh, it, well, it depends on the person, but uh, what we know is that HIIT can be performed by 
every person as long as the, the condition can, can allow us. But then it wouldn't be a matter of high intensity because if you really have a damage or uh, impaired uh, body system like that, I think then you know, even the, the moderate training uh, can be can, well, can be dangerous as well. So uh, of, we, today we try to give general rules uh, for almost everybody. Specific case like this uh, have to be addressed more specifically, of course. Thank you. Well, thank you, Paulo. I don't know if there, if there are any more questions. We're about to finish our first webinar. No more questions? Okay, so um, I would I would really like to um, to thank Paulo for this great presentation on behalf of everybody from Piaget Institute. Institute, it was it was very interesting. I would like to invite the participants uh, before they turn off the connection to answer just three questions. It's really easy and it's really important for us to to get to know your opinion about the webinar. So uh, you should be you should be able to, to see the questionnaire right now. And uh, you're welcome to, um, to participate, to fill out the, the questionnaire. And uh, once you're finished, you can, you can turn off your connection. Once again, thank you very much for participating in, in the webinar. I think it was a great experience. Paolo, can, you, can you put the first slide for, uh, again, please? Yes. Thank you very much. Just for the record. Okay. <laughs> Did everybody answer? We have as of now, 36 people who answer the uh, questionnaire. So we're getting there. Just for you to know, we had uh, 55 yeah. participants watching the seminar at the same time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> they will still feel the end. <laughs> but I think the is a really popular uh, trend in the last years. The yeah. interval training. And popular, but it's not very well known about yeah, because the, I, or I, how I, to use it or how to apply the, 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 the method. Uh, that's, that's what happens when the marketing control it. So it's more about marketing than actually mm -hmm. the proper use. Yeah. Good. So we have 45 people who responded. Mm -hmm. So I guess we can we can uh, turn off Denise. What do you say? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll. I'll finish the, uh, the question. Thank you, Paulo, for your presentation. It was very uh, inspiring, and uh, uh, I think for the students who are very helpful to to, to get some new new ideas and and uh, a different uh, approach about the the, the yeah. subject. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, I, uh, it was really a pleasure for me, and uh, once again. Uh, thank you to the Institute and uh, and of course you, Jose. And uh, since the lockdown keeps going here in Italy, at least, uh, well, if you need me one more time, I'm absolutely available. Yeah, we would appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Paolo. No, thank you. Okay. The work of you, know that.